Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode four of Chicks and Sticks, brought to you by the Hockey Riders. My name is Melissa Boyd, and I'm once again joined by my esteemed fellow writers, Christy Flannery, Hannah Garfield, and Mariah Holland. Hi, ladies. How are you doing tonight? Hey. hey. How are you? Good. Good. So if you're enjoying our show, make sure to drop us a like, a follow, or a comment from wherever you're watching or listening. And please don't be shy to send us in your questions, and we'll be sure to answer them in a future episode. This week, we're very excited to be joined by Courtney Stone for our NHL playoff discussion. Courtney uh, covers the Winnipeg Jets for the Hockey Writers. So we're going to get the scoop about Winnipeg's surprising first round sweep of the Oilers. Hi, Courtney. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. So I wanted to, before we get into the playoffs, I wanted to touch on a few topics quickly. First of all, uh, the Canadian leg of the Secret Dream Gap Tour is currently uh, underway in Calgary until Sunday. This is a women's hockey showcase, which features three teams made up of top Canadian players, including names you've probably heard before, Marie-Philippe Poulain, Natalie Spooner, Sarah Nurse, and many more. And the best news, Sportsnet, Sportsnet is broadcasting the games here in Canada. So if you're a Canadian like myself and like Courtney, uh, please, be sure to tune in if you can, because uh, I did watch the first leg of the tour uh, that happened in Boston, I believe, and it was really great, great quality. So if you can, make sure to tune in. Uh, the second topic I want to talk about, well, we would be remiss if we weren't talking about the IHF World Championship also currently being played in Latvia. And well, so far through the during the first few days of the tournament, there have been a ton of upsets. Just to give you an idea, uh, Finland and Germany currently lead Group B, Group B, which also has Canada and the U.S. So lots of, a little bit sort of a reverse of what you would expect. In Group A, Russia sits atop the standings, while Sweden, you know, powerhouse Sweden, is actually eighth. Um, so not a great tournament so far for the favorites, I would say. And just yesterday, actually, Great Britain, of all, all teams, uh, beat Belarus to earn its first regulation win at the world since 1962. So my question is, uh, do we think that all of these upsets in this tournament is good to for the game to grow it internationally? Henna, what do you think? I think it's awesome that all these like smaller countries, you know, on the smaller countries in the hockey standpoint are winning. Cause when you see that, when you see your home country win, there's something really exciting about it. I mean, look at what, the miracle on ice did for hockey in the United States. It blew up after the U S won the Olympic gold medal. And I'm not saying these countries are necessarily going to win the world championship or that the world championship is the same on the same level as the Olympics. Cause the Olympics are, you know, the Olympics are the top tier for international events, but it's really exciting for these teams. You know, Kazakhstan beat Finland, Denmark beat Sweden, like these smaller countries, it's going to create, you know, for little kids playing hockey in those countries, it's going to create some excitement and they're not going to care that, you know, maybe, maybe the top talent isn't playing the playing in the tournament because a lot of, you know, a lot of the teams that are either a lot of the top talent are either still playing the playoffs or opted out of the world championship this year. They're just going to remember that their team or their country won. And that's going to, create more interest in the game and it's going to create more players and that's ultimately what you want as fans because the more kids playing hockey the more talent the bigger the talent pool is and that's how we're going to get the top talent in NHL for us to watch as fans I mean I feel like this the story that gets told all the time now is Austin Matthews you know wouldn't be playing hockey if there wasn't a hockey team in Arizona so it's kind of the same idea of, you know, seeing these big wins happening in these smaller hockey countries are going to generate more interest in the sport. And on just one more quick note before I go on, go on too long about this, um, it also is generating buzz for the tournament in general, which it's actually making it more, you know, tuning in more. I was, I, this tournament was not on my radar at all. And now I'm kind of interested to see if, oh, maybe a surprise could reach the podium this year. And it's 
which is what the IIHF is ultimately going to want is more interest in the tournament. So they better, they're probably thrilled that these smaller teams are winning. Yeah, for sure. And I think that, as you said, in the case of Austin Matthews, I think it's the same for these players from the smaller countries is that it's kind of a window for them to showcase their skills and who knows, you know, maybe we'll see a couple of them, you know, get, you know, uh, their first, you know, and, you know, professional contracts here in North America or even in, you know, the bigger uh, leagues in Europe. So definitely, I totally agree. Um, the last topic I wanted to cover involves, happened actually a few weeks ago, but there were two significant hires in the NHL. Um, in Toronto, Team Canada legends, uh, Haley Wickenheiser and Danielle Goyette are teammates again with the Maple Leafs. Uh, in their uh, player development department, actually. So what happened is that general manager, manager Kyle Dubas uh, actually promoted Wickenheiser to senior director of player development. And then Wickenheiser uh, hired Goyette to be a director in the department. And in New Jersey, former U.S. Women's National Hockey Team cat Captain Megan Dugan has been hired by the Devils to, be, to also manage their player development. So what I wanted to know um, is... Do we think that these hires, while they're amazing, do we think that it kind of opens the door for more, you know, for women being hired in more prominent roles, either ex in an executive role or behind the bench even? Uh, I don't know, Courtney, what do you think about that? Um, I think absolutely it does because there are women that are interested in sports industry, obviously, and by seeing these successful players and successful athletes finally get those positions of power in within the organization it definitely gives them it probably gives people motivation and it gives people um, individuals to look up to and say if, if they did it maybe I can do it too um, and I think it's interesting though because while it's great to see these women getting these positions the fact that there's still major news stories that a woman is getting um, a major position in the NHL and in these sports organizations shows that we still have a long way to go before this is normalized. Yes, definitely. Absolutely. Well, I'm just looking forward to the day when there's, there's a woman either behind the bench or in, in the, in the, in the office someday. So I think it's like you said, I think it's uh, going to be here sooner rather than later. Anyway, let's hope. Um, so now uh, we're getting into the meat of our of our show this week. We're going to do a roundtable of the to cover what's been happening so far in the first round of the playoffs. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, really exciting action from all of the series, and we're lucky because actually our, the four of us and Courtney we cover each division for the hockey writer. So. Uh, we were, it, this is going to be good. So we're going to be able to touch base on, on everybody with everybody. So I wanted to start with the Honda West division and Mariah. So we've had a sweep by Colorado over the St. Louis Blues and uh, Mariah's Minnesota Wild have forced a great game seven against the Vegas Golden Knights. So Mariah, can you talk to us a little bit what's going on in the West? Yeah, we'll start with the Blues wow. and Avalanche because I'll try to make this as fast as I can. Uh, both series were actually quite interesting, but honestly, with the Blues and Avs, I thought it was going to be a lot closer than it was. Nothing against the Blues at all because they're still a great team, but I didn't expect them to get swept in four. But the Avs are also just outrageously good this year too. I mean, McKinnon and Landeskog both were up there in points which shouldn't really be a surprise and both of them well Landis Gog had points in all four games McKinnon three out of the four so I mean I didn't really get a chance to watch much of it because I was kind of focusing on the wild series to be completely honest but I mean when I looked at the stats I wasn't super surprised in Colorado at all even Philip Grubauer and goal had you know 100 10 shots on him and 103 saves. So he only let in seven goals, which is pretty outstanding in the playoffs. And I mean, St. Louis, I honestly thought Bennington would be 
I shouldn't say better because I didn't see his play, but I thought it would the goal the games would be a lot closer. I didn't expect three goal gaps or more in all of the games. And I mean, they did. Colorado also scored six empty net goals. So, yeah. And the biggest thing I even heard of that series besides the sweep was when uh, Kadri got suspended yeah. for that really nasty hit. <laughs> Did any of you guys want to add to that one before I go on to my series? McKinnon got a hat trick at one point, didn't he? Yeah, the first game, I think he did. First or second game? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, he scored nine points on 16 shots. So I wonder if Colorado is deep enough to make it to the final. Being they would have to, if Minnesota can pull it off tomorrow and they'd have to get by them, I'm really hoping not. <laughs> but I mean, I can't lie and say I don't think they are because I yeah. think they are. Yeah. I'm but just adding on. Our... Oh, yeah. Go sorry. ahead, Courtney. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, just adding on to your point on the Kadri hit. All I was thinking when I saw he got suspended was Dubis was probably up there thinking, yeah, we made the right decision <laughs> trading him. <laughs> so, I mean, that's what they're worried about. He keeps getting suspended in these playoffs for careless hits. And I think he's been in the league long enough to know that you can't do that when it well, gets that, to the playoffs. Yeah. That hit, I rewatched it before coming on the show. And it's just that hit was just so dirty, like, there wasn't yeah. really any way around to say it's not. Mm -hmm. And it was very intentional too. So. Oh yeah. Do we think it's going to actually get appealed? Because I know he had a appeal date today, and should it be appealed? Yeah, I I, I I'm not sure. I mean, and you know that appeal going is going straight to or was heard by by Batman. So and you know he's. I, I don't think it will get reduced. Um, I mean, he's, you know, it's like, yeah, I guess there's like a running joke that like the playoffs haven't started until Kaji gets suspended. Like, it's kind of like <laughs> so horrible. I mean, what it feels like, right? But I, I but I think uh, that I think if Grubauer can, you know, play steady in net, like he doesn't even have to be great. If he can just be solid and steady, I think, yeah, for sure. I think Colorado's the favorite to get to the final, definitely. Yeah, Bennington just wasn't up for the task this year. Well, so. and even the yeah. thing that surprised me the most was Ryan O'Reilly, their captain, came out and just flat out took yeah. blame for it. He's like, I didn't play like I should have, and why should I expect my teammates to? It's like, that's a lot being oh. your team, taking the blame <laughs> all on yourself. I guess that's what makes a good captain though, right? That's very true. Yeah. But I was a blue sweat personally. Too <laughs> <laughs> <A little> bitter. <laughs> so uh, what do you so what are you I, I I know who you're rooting for in game seven, but uh, do you think they can the wild can complete the comeback? Honestly. <laughs> Coming off of stu two straight wins, one of them being on the road in Vegas. Well, two of their three wins are in Vegas. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's – and they're on fire. They're pumped up, especially after last night. I think I think they can because Vegas is kind of like, whoa, wait, what's going on? <laughs> and, I mean, honestly, the key to the series has been their goaltending. Flurry, other than the first – I mean, even the first game, they went into overtime. No one could score on either one. And Flurry's just been his typical self and mm -hmm. making ridiculous saves. And then Talbot stepped up to get them to where they are now. And I mean, yeah, I, th I think they honestly can. And I'm really excited. But we'll see. Because Vegas, I think, did they up their capacity limit too just recently? I think I saw they did. Yeah, because I thought when I was listening, they said something about there's going to be even more fans when they come back. And it's like, okay. But, I mean, I was a little bitter in a couple of their losses with the overturned goals. I mean, the offsides one was obviously offsides. But when Flurry, I don't know if any of you saw it, but he, 
the one where he saved it behind his back and the yeah. glove was in the net. Mm -hmm. I was pretty upset and probably still am about that because <laughs> I mean, they you could see the puck for a point, and then it's like, okay, if he takes it out and it's in his glove, yeah, I get the rule is you can't see it, no goal, but it's kind of obvious where it was. How much of a surprise has Cam Talbot been this postseason? Like, I feel like he's the goalie that kind of came out of nowhere and really surprised everybody with his performance because he has two shutouts, correct? Yeah, he, he does. Um, honestly, I want to say I'm so – it's a hard thing to say because when they brought him in in the beginning of the year, I wasn't too pleased. I was like, okay, mm -hmm. who is this? What are we doing? Yeah. And, I mean, he played quite well throughout the season, had some struggles, I believe, but mm -hmm. I've been – very happy with his playoffs I knew he would make the step up because I knew he was capable of it and I mean even when his defense was kind of collapsing around him in those losses he wasn't the reason he just he was kind of hung out to dry so mm -hmm. he's been their rock and they can thank him for where they are <laughs> <laughs> and I mean yeah, last night sure. it was pretty impressive when Dumba hit tuck at first I wasn't I was like oh god that's going to be a nasty hit from the angle and then mm -hmm. they slowed down and showed it and he actually he kept his shoulder down it was a clean hit and then the fight after the fact I was like okay great you know like Mel when we were talking earlier about the fights I wasn't too pleased with that but then when mm -hmm. he's he's skating to the box just doing this and just yeah. saying let's go that was yeah. that was worth every second of seeing that yeah and I think that helped them keep going, too. So, I mean, I'm very excited and very nervous for tomorrow night. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> what do, what does Minnesota, what do they need to do to win game seven? Score. I mean, that's kind of an obvious one because Flurry is going to be, if they can get Flurry out of his zone early, I think that is the biggest key because – Whenever I've watched Flurry and they his team loses, he if they score, he usually get you can see him get kind of affected by it because he's a very mental aspect goaltender. I don't know if I'm stating that correctly, but he gets very affected mentally. So if they start getting goals on him early, I think they can pull it out. And obviously Talbot's got to be ready to go. A lot of like I've been talking with the hockey Raiders wild team back and forth and a lot of them want Boldy Matt Boldy to play and they're wondering why he's mm -hmm. not so it'll be interesting to see if they put him in or not because the one player we were thinking they could replace him with is Bukestead but Bukestead just scored the other night so it's going to be a big waiting game and we'll have to wait and see because if they don't make it I'm sure Boldy will be a big topic and if they do it'll be if he's going to play in the next series so yeah it's been a lot of drama <laughs> I'm sorry say that again I didn't hear you we're going to be talking about Boldy <laughs> I should have known <laughs> so I guess we can move now over to the uh Florida Tampa series and the Nashville and Carolina series, because uh, we haven't heard much from Christy yet. So, <laughs> uh, as, as you can see, as you can see, Christy is repping the Preds tonight. I am uh, hoping for a game, seven, hoping for a game seven. So, can you sort of give us a rundown of how those series have gone so far? Okay, so I guess we'll start with the Predators Hurricanes, who play. In like an hour um it's been a i think that the predators are putting up more of a fight than people expected i think this was the one series that people did think that carolina was going to sweep the predators and they kind of just keep coming back uh i think it's really hard to say that saros isn't probably the one of the best goaltenders in the playoffs right now and again he's the reason why they're being so successful uh, I think the key for the Predators is to stay out of the penalty box. And if they're on the power play, they need to actually score. The one game, I think they had seven power play chances and they scored zero goals. <laughs> so they definitely need to kind of work on their special teams if they want to survive. 
On the other side, um, the Delkovich, I feel like is becoming a household name. Like people are who did not follow the Carolina Hurricanes, they now know who he is. He's been phenomenal. The goaltending's been very good that um, during the series. And Rod Brindamore should probably get the uh, Jack Adams trophy because he did a, a really, the team's great. Carolina is a really solid team and they're, they're an organization where it's kind of hard to root against them. Like, I don't know if it's just the fact that they're young or the like bunch of jerks, but they're, it's a hard team to not root for. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. I, part of me thinks the Canes are going to close out tonight, but Bridgestone's a tough arena. It's a tough arena for arena for visitors to uh, come in and win. So it's going to be interesting. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens with that series. It's going to be fun. I and feel that, like, I yeah. feel like uh, Matt Duchesne has really sort of come out of his shell in this series. I, I, you yeah. know, I think he had a quiet regular season, but he, he's been really, really good. Yeah. For Nashville. At, yeah. Right at the right time, obviously. Yeah, his yeah, his overtime goal was really great. And you know, that's kind of what you need. You need those players that were kind of quiet in the regular season to step up in the postseason, you know, to win, to go far and to win the Stanley Cup. It's a team effort. It's not just one or two guys. And you need a hot goaltender, which is what they have. So as long as they can get the rest of the pieces going, um, they should be in good shape. But you know, the Carolina Hurricanes are a stacked team. It's a good opponent. Um, and the winner of this series is going on to face the Tampa Bay Lightning. Now it's funny because the first note I took for the Tampa, Florida series days ago was that Spencer Knight was going to be the X factor of the series. And clearly that was not correct. <laughs> it was correct for one game. And then that kind of fizzled out, sure. but uh, Tam- Tampa's a good team. They're just, they're the depth on that team is just, it's really, it's crazy when you think about it. I know Kucherov leads all players in the playoffs. I think he has like 11 points, but then you have Stamkos, you have Coleman getting goals and getting assists. Pat Maroon scored. So again, they're getting scoring up and down the lineup. Um, the only concern I have with Tampa is I don't think Vasilevsky is up to form quite yet. Because he let in four goals the one game, six goals, another game that he let up four goals. So I feel like he's a little shaky at the moment. But Hedman, I think, leads all defensemen with points. So as long as Hedman's kind of there to balance Vasilevsky out, Tampa's going to be fine. Is anyone beating Hedman for the Norris Trophy this year? You know... You know me, I like to have, I like to share the love. I like a bunch of different players to kind of like have their moment. I thought Nurse had a really good season in Edmonton. I thought he was really good. Who was it? Fox for the Rangers. He did really well this year as well. Um, I don't know. I, I'm the kind of person where I like seeing new players and like new teams win. Like as much as it was fun to see Obechki get the cup and, you know, the Blues get the cup, it's kind of exciting to know that they're out. And like, it makes room for somebody else that hasn't really had that spotlight to kind of jump in and make that moment to have that moment. So I don't know. I'm not really, I'm not the biggest Hedman fan. I'm not going to say he's overrated because he is very good at his position, but I think there's other candidates that should get recognition as well. For sure. Well, it's a bit, it felt, it feels like every time Kucherov is on the ice, was on the ice during against Florida he scored like that's almost how it felt you know yeah he's, like wow you yeah. the whole season and you're playing like this like wow <laughs> yeah he he's honestly he's kind of just everywhere I think he has eight assists so he funny enough Jonathan Huberdeau was also tied with him at eight assists yeah. he was the second highest scorer in the uh in the playoffs so far yeah they're, uh, yeah, him and Hubido and Barkov are one impressive duo. Like, wow, they they uh, they know where to find them each other on the ice. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of good chemistry. So it's yeah. going to be interesting to see either the Canes or the Preds face off against Tampa. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Like, who can stop Tampa at this point in time? <laughs> yeah, I agree for sure. <laughs> yep, definitely. Stop the repeat. <laughs> right? It's like, just give me someone, just give me, give me another captain to raise the cup. Just one, just somebody else. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. So now we're going to move over to the Boston Washington series, uh, which 
what whose result was uh, very pleasing for Hannah, <laughs> as, a, uh, as our Boston rep uh, on this show, and also the Pittsburgh New York Islander series, which just wrapped up last night with the Islanders taking it in six games. So, Hannah, give us the rundown. Yeah. So I guess I'll start with the Pittsburgh Islanders um, since they just wrapped up last night and. I'm not surprised that the Islanders beat Pittsburgh, especially when you watch those games. It, Pittsburgh just, it didn't, they didn't look like the number one seed. No. And, you know, kind of going into it, I didn't really think seeding mattered that much in the East because all four teams that made the playoffs were number one seed at some point in the season. Mm-hmm. So really, I mean, the best part was the Bruins getting, you know, the third seed and matching up against Washington. Um I think that that was the better matchup for them, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the big story of the Pittsburgh Islanders season uh, series is Tristan Dari. He just, I never, I'm not the person that's normally says that a team, it, I don't put a loss on like one player, mm-hmm. but if I was ever tempted to do that, it would be that series. Um, even though at the end of the day, you know, Jari didn't play well, but mm-hmm. No, no one on Pittsburgh was really that impressive to me. And the star, like Malkin and Crosby, you no, know, they were fine, but they weren't, you know, good enough to win that series. And I think the Islanders were the better team and they proved it. And it's going to be a, I think it would be a really good matchup between the Islanders and Bruins in the second round. Did you see a lack of heart from the Pittsburgh Penguins? Cause I felt like there was no energy when I watched those games. I, I, I felt the same thing last year watching the Penguins. Like they just, they kind of, they've really, for the last two years, they've really fizzled out in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I mean, they obviously, they made changes this year with Pittsburgh and they have a new GM. Um, and Mike Sullivan is, a, I think he is a great coach in this league and honestly should be in the conversation for the Jack Adams. I do agree. Rod Brindamore should win it. Let's just throw them all in. <laughs> Yeah, but I think Sullivan should really, he should be, he should be in the conversation. They had so many, you know, they overcame so much in this regular season with the injuries and, and then they just got to the playoffs and it was like, I don't know. There was just such a lack of interest, like you said. Um, yeah. And then, you know, moving on to Boston, Washington, which is, you know, one I really want to talk about. I you know, I think this, the Bruins this year are what was most kind of uplifting as a fan to watch this year is that all the things that went wrong last year when they lost in the second round to the Tampa, really, they kind of had the reverse. So last year, you know, in the playoffs, they got worse as series went on. And this year, this, um, this series, they got better, you know, game one was clearly their worst game. It was the only one they lost. I don't know how they got to overtime because you watch that game Mm -hmm. and they couldn't stop the odd man rush. They couldn't score. I think the top line only had like one, one or two shots between them. They had a goalie who was only um, playing in his fifth game that season and they weren't shooting on him. And it was so infuriating to watch. And you really felt like if this is what the Bruins are going to do, they're, they're going to get swept in four, but they actually, they got better. And that was, that's what you want to see when you're watching these playoff series is you want to see the team you support get better. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Tuka Rask was phenomenal. You know, the anti, <laughs> there's such an anti Rask contingent around Boston. And of course they were all up in arms after game one, but in, in reality, he kept them in that game. Sure. He should have stopped that overtime goal. Cause it was, you know, it was a soft goal, but I, he was the only reason they got to overtime in the first place, I would say. Uh, he ended the series of a um, 9, 9.941 per save percentage and a 1.81 goals against average. Um, he deserve, he's, I feel like the, the, we keep coming back to the goalies in these conversations because it's really, it is the goalies that are on fire are the ones that are really, you know, making the headlines. Mm-hmm. Um, and outside of, uh, the goaltending, it was really great to see depth scoring from the Bruins. That's been their issue for years. It's what killed them last year. Um, and this year, in their five games against Washington, they had goals from 
uh, Richie, Smith, Coyle, Grizzick, and then two from DeBrusque and two from Hall. Last year in their five game loss to Tampa, they only had, um, and then of course the top line has goals all the time, but you know, you expect goals from them and it's the depth that's been missing for years. And last year, outside of the outside of Bergeron, Marsha and Poshnok, they only had goals from Coyle, Richie, DeBrusque, and Preci. So mm-hmm. it's really it's such a positive thing for the team to be getting that help. And I think that's going to make a big difference against the Islanders. I think what's really crazy is that when you saw it at the beginning of, you know, at the beginning of the series, when you saw that Boston and Washington were matching up together they looked like they were so close. Like everyone thought this was a series that was going to go to seven games because they were just so evenly matched and they really weren't like Washington just didn't have it. And I saw something that how um, the Washington GM basically said that they're open to trade anybody who's not Ovechkin or Backstrom. So I'm like, is this the summer they're going to blow up the roster? I, I wouldn't be surprised. And honestly, I feel like it's all going to come back to Craig Smith's overtime, <laughs> like second overtime goal in game three that was like the game changer of the series mm-hmm. because they came out in game four and Washington was not the same team in games four and five yeah. after that, you know, second overtime. Mm-hmm. And you know, it was the mistake on Samsonov and you saw the clip of Ovechkin mm-hmm. waiting him afterwards. And mm-hmm. I feel like if, if the Capitals blow up their team this summer, it's got, it's because of that one double overtime goal. Because of Craig Smith. Because of Craig Smith. <laughs> So I guess we'll finish then with the best division of all. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the, uh, no bias Canadian, here. <laughs> the Canadian division. Uh, so I will, we'll, I'll start with the Toronto Montreal series uh, and then we'll finish with Courtney and Edmonton and Winnipeg. But um, yeah, well, the Toronto Montreal series, I think has not uh, delivered on expectations. Everyone was so looking forward to this this matchup. Um, first time in forever that these two storied rivals have played each other. And to be quite honest with you, the series has been quite a dud so far. Um, they, and I'm not saying that because the Canadians are losing the series. I just find that the games have been pretty, you know, they don't feel like um, playoff games. Although I will say, one thing we're missing here in Canada is definitely is the fans. Um, you know, I'm watching the other series in the U S and it just makes such a big difference, um, in the atmosphere. And you can tell that it, you know, inspires the players and, you know, I just find the quality of play has been a lot better. Um, but yeah, I mean, like Montreal has, has struggled. That's not a secret, um, mightily, um, they haven't been able to score even though uh, Carey Price has been fantastic. Mm-hmm. And actually, um, you know, Toronto um, obviously, um, unfortunately lost their captain in game one. And, but you know what, it's actually, there are depth players, you know, Hannah was talking about the depth on Boston. I think actually the depth in Toronto is actually shining right now. Um, you know, Austin Matthews has one goal and Mitch Warner has no goals so far, but the, you know, William Nylander and um, Alex Kerfoot, Alex Galchenyuk are all the players that are stepping up and, and scoring for Toronto. So, you know, we, you know, everybody talked about their depth heading into the season. And I think it's really coming, shining through uh, mm-hmm. so far. And actually Jack Campbell has been very good. They were all, you know, he was a question mark as well. Can he sort of carry over his regular season plan to the playoffs? And so far he's been very, very good. So, you know, it's just, you know, it, it, it comes down to it that Toronto is a better team than Montreal. So, you know, I think we're seeing, obviously we've seen that through these first games and, but hopefully uh, Montreal can pull out a win in game five so that there will be fans <coughs> in the stand for the first time in Canada for game six at the Bell Center. That would be really special. So yeah, that's about, <laughs> that about covers it for that series. But uh, yeah, hoping for a game six on Saturday. I have a quick question for you. Yes. I saw, I've been seeing some stuff on Twitter about if the Montreal Canadiens lose this series, (laughs) 
if Carrie does Carrie Price ask for a trade and should he be traded? Yeah, it's um, let's just say that <laughs> since especially since their four nothing loss in game four where they it basically felt like an exhibition game. Mm -hmm. um, Twitter has been a flame, <laughs> has been set a fire. Um, and you know, they're already you know, they already want everyone fired and traded and everything. But yeah, in terms for carry a price, I think if he was going to ask to be traded, he would have done it already. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's a very loyal person. Um, he people don't realize it very because he's a very, you know, quiet person. He's very, you know, very he doesn't say very reserved, he doesn't say a lot, but he is very, very proud to be a Montreal Canadian incredibly proud to be Montreal Canadian and I think that if he was going to ask to be traded he was he would do it by now I know that there was you know there are people out there as well who think that he you know Montreal should ask him to lift his no move clause for the expansion draft so that they can protect Jake Allen instead so that thinking that Seattle won't take Carey Price anyway given his big contract but that's just not going to happen uh, because there's just too much respect on both sides. I think right now to mm -hmm. do that. And I think especially mm -hmm. after this playoff performance, I don't think you can do it. You know, he's the one guy who's actually showed up and he's done it in the last few years. He's, he's a big game playoff performer. So, mm -hmm. and I say that about him as well. Like I don't, I don't really worry about what he does in the regular season. Um, me, it's for me, what matters is what he's doing come playoff time so <clears throat> is it, uh, it's a crazy world that we live in that the Montreal Toronto series is kind of the most boring series and the Florida Tampa series was a series that everyone was going nuts for like what happened yeah. like, you know, that that's like the, <laughs> those are these yeah. turns, like, tables have turned old yeah, it's, it's, guys are rolling over in their graves right now yeah exactly <laughs> yes um well, and you know, Mon Montreal is kind of playing this series like it's the 80s or 90s too, you know, with the, you know, obviously, I, I mean, of course they had to put a premium on their defensive play because they have to be able to stop, you know, Toronto's big guns. But I mean, there's, there's being defensive and, you know, that, and then there's not generating any offense at all. Like that's, it's not the same, same thing. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's too bad, but you know, it's not over yet. So we'll see. Um, I have a question also for you, Melissa, or anyone else who yes. wants to pitch in. Since Jack Campbell has been playing so well in the regular season and into the playoffs, and Anderson's been injured for so long, and even when he played like this season, I think he had his the worst uh, save percentage of his entire career. Do you think this is the end for Anderson? Do you think he's going to be traded because Campbell's just proven to be so yeah. consistent. Well, I, I don't see it ending another way. Actually, I believe he's a unrestricted free agent at the end of the season. So I think he will walk probably um, because, yeah, I mean, it's clear that uh, Jack Campbell is now the number one goalie. And, you know, there's, there's of course, in Toronto's case, salary cap considerations. They don't have a ton of, of mm -hmm. it or they have a lot of it. Um, mm -hmm obviously. So I don't think them re-signing Freddie Anderson to be the backup is maybe the best option because I don't think he's going to take, you know, that big of a pay cut. So yeah, I think, I think it's pretty clear. And actually there was even a, so between game three and game four, there was, it was a back-to-back -back and, um, you know, Sheldon Keefe wouldn't say right away that Jack Campbell was going to start game four on the back-to-back. -back. And I just thought like, this shouldn't even be a, question like mm -hmm. of course he needs to start like um and he did but yeah I mean he's 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 been very very good and and because he's actually being I think out overshadowed a bit by price because price has been that or has had to be that good and has had to make so many like you know five star saves and Jack Hamill has just been really really solid when he needs to be and you know all credit to him because uh, yeah, for sure. 
what would Montreal have to do to come out of that series to go to round two? Four. <laughs> um, yeah, they they need to score and they need to show a little bit more. I mean, I can't believe, honestly, that I'm saying this, but they need to show that they want it a little bit more. Um, you know, it's, it's just, they've just, you know, I swear, like, these first few games they've used except for game one which they want to you know it felt like I'm like do they think they're playing in the regular season or something because um they need to step it up a little bit um and they need uh besides price um you know nobody's really showed up um they need Gallagher to step up they need Jeff Petrie to step up they need her to step up um mm-hmm just yeah the core has just not been there um and um but again they've you know they've come back from 3-1 before happened in uh 2010 um 2014 they were badly outmatched in those series against better teams just like toronto and they came back from 3-1 deficit but why did they come back because they played their butts off (laughs) And they played really hard and they got great goaltending. So if Montreal can do that, um, then maybe they, they can come back. Who knows? And, you know, uh, Toronto is trying to uh, lift a curse here, uh, winning their first uh, playoff series in a long time. So, you know, that's, I think that's going to be tough for them. You know, it's, I mean, we laugh, it's, it's, but it is, it is, it's a huge burden that's on their shoulders right now. Um, and what so do you do, we'll see what do you do in Toronto when you when they get eliminated in the first round like where do you go from there I would so, honestly <laughs> I I I wouldn't want to be Kyle Dubas if that happens oh. um I I I have a lot ton of respect for Kyle Dubas I think he's done a really good job in Toronto and I honestly don't know what you do I, I, especially now being up three, mm-hmm. one, I, I mean, I don't know. Do you, do you trade one of your $10 million players? Yeah, maybe, but again, you know, the option there, the, the, the realistic option there would be William Nylander, but he's mm-hmm. been so good in these playoffs. Yeah. I'm, I'm not so sure. not so sure I would do that. So yeah, oh, geez. Yeah, <laughs> that's it, a loaded it, question. <laughs> because like the stage is set that if they don't reach the final, this season was a fail. So there's yes. just so Absolutely. much pressure riding on that, and like you said, you're, they're trying to kind of get over the first hurdle. So it's like, what do you do when they get eliminated in the first round or the second round? Because it's not going to yeah, be. A game. And you know, let's not forget they they kind of went all in with this Nick Foligno trade mm-hmm. as well. Um, they're trading away their first round pick. Um, mm-hmm. They gave up a lot for Nick Felino. Yeah. So, you know, if they, yeah, geez, I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm thinking about what would happen if there were multiple ten million dollar players on on the market this summer. <laughs> like, yes, it's, um, on the market, and if Toronto loses and they you know, are blowing up their roster, like, right. It's like, you get yeah. a $10 million player, you get a million, $10 million player. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, that's, um, that's a tough call. And, I mean, I th- no, I think, I think actually, whichever team loses this series, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a rock and roll off season. I mean, it always is in those yeah. markets anyway, but mm-hmm. um. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's not going to be pretty for Montreal either. If they well, if they lose tonight, it won't be pretty. I think if they can show a little bit of mm-hmm. resolve here, it might not be as bad. But if they lose tonight, it's not going to be pretty either. So, yeah. And I think with the Leafs as well, it's been great seeing their veteran players step up and score in the playoffs. Because as much as it's great to have them as a staple on the team and as a as someone to look up to in the locker room, seeing them actually score in the playoffs. Like, I don't think that was the, that was not the objective of getting someone like Spets on the team, but to see them be able to mm-hmm. follow through like that score, mm-hmm. it's, 
it's great to see. Yeah, Spezza has been unreal since, well, actually since he got to Toronto. Um, you know, he, he, you know, he's definitely having a, you know, rebirth or something in mm -hmm. Toronto. And mm -hmm. actually, he, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he's the current active player who has the most points against Montreal in his career. So he, he loves playing the Habs. So I'm not surprised that he's, he's doing well, but yeah, he's what a player and what a, what a pickup, you know, at 700,000 uh, a year. It's like, mm -hmm. that's a steal. Um, mm -hmm big time steal so yeah and I, I still can't believe his his first game with the Leafs at in his hometown I believe uh it was scratched by Mac by Mike Babcock like yeah. <laughs> when he scores in the playoffs yeah. just like in amazing the how <laughs> it's amazing how yeah <laughs> it's amazing how things work out so exactly yeah but for sure he's been a huge x factor and um, him and Wayne Simmons as well mm -hmm. has been, you know, really good for them too. So for sure. And who doesn't want to see Jim Thornton win the cup? You know? Exactly. There's all, at least there's that yeah. one story that I think mo like every hockey fan like, can agree on. Like you may not want to see Toronto win, but it would be really something to see Joe Thornton get a cup. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Um. Yeah, he's, it's amazing, though, that he's, you know, as effective as he is. Yeah. You know, he yeah. considering, you know, how he slowed down, like, a lot. Mm -hmm. And, but he's still, you know, effective. He scored, he scored a, a goal the other night. Um, yeah. Just, you know, it's, like, amazing. This guy just never, never stops. Yeah. <laughs> um, wonder how much longer he's going to go, you know. <laughs> Until he gets a copy for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Um, so I guess uh, we can throw it over to Courtney now to wrap it up with Winnipeg and Edmonton. I think the most, to me, the most surprising result so far of these playoffs is Winnipeg's sweep of Edmonton. I did not see that coming at all. So I don't know. I think Christy had a question for Courtney. Hey, Courtney. Hey. <laughs> so my question is, uh, obviously, when you play Edmonton, McDavid and Drysdale are the two players that come to mind. And Winnipeg was very effective in basically shutting those two players down. Do you think that because of that, it was almost easier to play Edmonton? Because really, when you go in, your job is to shut those two players down. And because of Edmonton's lack of depth, do you think that was an advantage for Winnipeg? I'm going to say I don't think it was necessarily an advantage mm -hmm. because when you're playing that team, like Drysaddle and McDavid, when they're on the ice, there's a strong, strong chance they're going to score. Mm -hmm. And so you have to put all of your efforts in that area over like the rest of the lines. They're a threat no matter what. So I think that's mm -hmm. going to make it difficult for the Jets regardless. Mm -hmm. And it definitely was not easy for the Jets to beat them because if you look at the games, game one was a 4-1 with a 4-1 win for the Jets. Mm -hmm. All of the other games were determined by a one goal differential. So we had like one nothing in game two, five, four, game three, and then four to three in game four. And three out of those four games all went to overtime. Mm -hmm. Of course, everyone knows game four was that triple overtime, which was ridiculous. So that alone just shows it was not an easy feat for the Jets. Yeah. Um, they definitely put up a fight. And even game three, they were losing 4-1 and mm -hmm. came back three goals in the third period, I believe. So, yeah. yeah, it was definitely tricky. And when you look at the regular season, the Jets lost seven of the nine games that they played mm -hmm. against the Oilers. So the fact that they only won two games in the regular season and then run four in a row in the playoffs, like no one saw that coming. And that was a lot of effort put into by the team, by the coaching. You could see their game definitely changed when they entered the playoffs. And I don't think Edmonton was expecting that drastic mm -hmm. of a change from the players either, especially like defensively. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was not an easy feat. And Drysettle and McDavid put up a fight like, regardless on the ice so 
what was the change from the regular season to the postseason? You think, do you credit the coach for that? What do you think was the big turnaround? Um, I mean, ultimately, I guess it probably would be on the coaching staff and, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because they're giving the direction, but the players, like they fought their butts off in the series. It was, it was not easy. And I was really shocked. Like I'm a Leafs fan, so there's not much defense (laughs) defensiveness, like on that team. So watching the jets, it was a very different game. Mm -hmm. They were constantly, not just in their positions, not where they should be at all times, but actively trying to get that puck and trying to interfere, interfere with plays. They, they played an excellent two-way game in the playoffs and that's Mm -hmm. where I think they really improved. Okay. What do you think was ultimately the biggest difference maker in the jet for the jets in this series? Like, was there a specific player that really stood out? Um, to me, there was a couple people, I think, uh, Nikolai Ehlers was a big one because he was out for about a month. He hadn't played since m- mid April. And then he hopped into the playoffs game two and he, sorry, game three. And this was his first game back since mid April. He missed about a month of hockey and he scores two goals, one of them being the overtime winner. So that was huge. And then he also had a lot of scoring chances in game four as well. Um, but Ultimately, I would say Kyle Connor, I would say, was the biggest difference maker. That top line for the Jets is just a force to be reckoned with. Like Kyle Connor, Mark Shifley, and Blake Wheeler, their chemistry on the ice is unbelievable. I don't know if you guys thought, but they had this goal um, in, what game was it? I think game three. Uh, I could be wrong. Um, and it was just, it was ridiculous. It was like flawless to watch on the ice. Mm-hmm. So I think him scoring the overtime winner in game four, that triple overtime, I think that's the big reason why I would say he's the difference maker because he quite literally gave them that series win. And mm-hmm. it was interesting watching the panel um, while I was watching the game discuss who they thought would have to step up in this triple overtime. And they were saying probably the players who were playing less minutes because their big guys were playing like over 60 minutes um, in this triple overtime. So they were like, for these guys are exhausted. So it's more likely that someone who's playing less, less amount of time on the ice is going to come out with this win. And Kyle Connor, who I don't know exact, his exact minutes, but he had to be on the ice for around 60 minutes I would think gets this gets this winner in triple overtime like I would say he's the biggest difference maker for the Jets Mm -hmm. for sure agree so being being you're a Maple Leafs fan we probably know the answer to this question (laughs) but do you prefer the Jets play the Maple Leafs or the Habs in the second round for selfish reasons the Maple Leafs (laughs) I would love to see the Leafs get to the second round considering they haven't been to round two in, I think it was 17 years since 2004. So it's a long time. (laughs) Um, And I think also seeing the Jets play the Maple Leafs would be quite the game, quite the series to watch. The Leafs have such uh, young players, amazing speed and skill on the ice. And they have a lot of depth and so do the Jets. So to see them go head to head would be really exciting. I think the Jets would probably have to play a similar game to how they played against the Oilers in the sense that they really tried to shut down McDavid and Dreisaitl. And I think they'd have to do the same with players like Matthews and Marner on the ice. All of their attention should be on them when because you really can't let them have time or space on the ice with the puck because they're going to score and the two of them, their chemistry is just like undeniable. So Mm -hmm. yeah, but if I were to say which team I think the Jets would win against in the second round, I think they would win against the Habs just because their depth is just not quite the same as the Jets. Like you can't really compare the two. I think they would have a much easier time winning against them compared to the Leafs, but I think um, if the Jets played the Leafs, it would make for a much more entertaining series. Yeah, nobody wants to play the Habs for entertainment 
for the entertainment factor. <laughs> so one last one, I, I wanted to know, do you think the Jets have what it takes to be, to make it all the way, to make it to the Stanley Cup final and maybe even hoist the cup at the end? Honestly, why not? Like no one, no one thought they were going to sweep the Oilers. Like, I, I can say that confidently. If you thought they were going to sweep the Oilers, sweep the Oilers, like, yeah, I really don't think anyone <laughs> yeah. would, have guessed, would have predicted that. Yeah. They surprised the viewers, the hockey fans, and they showed they're a strong team and they're willing to step up when it's necessary. They can come together. They play a strong uh, offensive game, defensive game. I think they could take it all the way. I'm not going to say it's they're my number one pick. Like I, I, I don't know who's going to take it, but I think they could. I think it's possible. How important is Connor Hellebuck? Oh, extremely. He's <laughs> he's been playing an amazing game. Um, yeah, it's been incredible to see him make some ridiculous saves and just. I think when you're watching these games go into overtime, it's so easy to focus on the skaters on the ice, the forwards and the defensemen and think, wow, they must be exhausted. Like they're putting so much effort in, but they have shifts too. They're not on the ice for this entire time. Connor Hellebuck is mm -hmm. playing into the triple overtime, has to be fully dialed in. Can't You can't miss a beat because then you can, the series will take a whole different direction. So yeah, I think there's a lot of credit he should, people should give him more credit than he's been receiving because he's playing excellent. And he's the reigning Vesna Trophy winner, correct? Uh, yeah. Yeah. This postseason has really been the story of goaltending. I think yeah. in every mm -hmm. series we've been talking about it from mm -hmm. Jari losing it, <laughs> Jari yeah. losing it for the <laughs> Penguins to, you know, Sorrows. Mm -hmm. Filling it a natural. I really think goaltending is the story of this postseason. Yeah, it's yeah. always the key in the postseason, but for some reason, that's like the real spotlight this year. It's just who's going to have the best goaltender. And it's really about like timely saves also at the mm -hmm. right moment, you know, like with your team down a goal or up a goal. And mm -hmm. yeah, like, and I think for me, I ha I picked Edmonton to beat Winnipeg, but I said, I did too. You know what? I said, yeah. Connor Hellebuck, but I said if Connor Hellebuck can sort of play, you know, catch fire, or play at his Vesna level, I actually like I think uh, they can do it for sure. Mm -hmm. he, he proved proved that he could still mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for sure. And all just, right, well, as oh, an update, sorry, sorry <laughs> breaking news. I'll say it's breaking news. How about that? Does that make it better? Oh, good, uh, good. The, there is an actual Canadian Maple Like It's a game now. It's 3-2. So if you're not watching that game, make sure you're tuning in. It's going to be a good ending. Uh, Wait, it's 3-2. Who's leading? Believe the Canadians. Canadians are leading, but Maple Leafs are coming back. Oh, great. So That's great. Yeah. Um, but hey, they yeah. scored three goals, so that's an <laughs> <laughs> You can't expect a miracle. Just small baby steps. <laughs> is there any news as to what's going to happen if, depending upon what Canadian teams win if they're coming to the U.S. or vice versa? Is there any news on that? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard anything new uh, about that recently. Um, I know, yeah, it's being talked about, but I haven't heard any new mm -hmm. developments since then. But I, I mean, they're going to have to decide fairly soon, quickly. <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. what's happening? happen so yeah um we'll see but yeah it would be a shame if they had to play in another arena for for those last two rounds or mm -hmm. potentially so that's a big disadvantage actually for uh, for them um but hey what can you do we have hockey at least so that's all that counts <laughs> <laughs> all that matters <clears throat> Well, uh, on that, since you know, we have to get back to watching this game, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's all the time we have for this week. But I wanted to make sure to thank um, Courtney, especially for joining us this week. Thank you so much, Courtney. We had a lot of fun. 
Um, Thanks for having me. <laughs> and and uh, good luck to the Jets. And I, well, I'm not going to say good luck to the Leafs because that would be against my, <laughs> 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 that, that would be just bad for me. But um, yeah, thanks again. And we can come back anytime. And thank you to, uh, of course, to my three uh, sidekicks here. I shouldn't say that, but they're more than that. But uh, Hannah, Christy, and Mari, thank you so much again for being here this week. Thanks to all of you, of course, for watching and listening. Um, be sure to join us next week. We are very excited because we will be joined by Tampa Bay Lightning radio analyst and reporter Keely Chelios. So make sure you're tuned in for that. Um, and until then, be sure to check out all of the great shows produced by the Hockey Writers on YouTube, Facebook, and your favorite podcast platform. All of our shows are also now available, very big news, via iHeartRadio. Um, so we've hit the big time, so that's great news. Don't forget to visit thehockeywriters.com to read all of the great content that are that's being produced daily by all of our awesome writers. And uh, make sure you're following us on social media so you're not missing anything. And of course, sign up for our daily newsletter, Morning Skate, at morningskate.io. It'll start your day off right with all the latest hockey news. Thanks again. See you next week.